Hi everybody, welcome to episode 3 of my Paul McCartney album ranking series. So in the first two episodes I've been going back chronologically through the Paul McCartney albums from McCartney 3 backwards. By the end of this series we'll have got back to McCartney 1970 and as we hit each album I'm slotting it into this ranking that's starting to get bigger. You can see it on screen here where we are up to so far. I've gone back as far as Unplugged, the official bootleg so far. And so we're carrying on now into the 1980s and I'm going to carry on slotting these albums into these into this ranking as I feel based on my enjoyment of the album. That's that's all I am basing this on is how much do I enjoy listening to these albums? So we are kicking this episode off with Flowers in the Dirt from 1989. I cannot overstate the importance of this album in my life. This was the first album that came out when I was starting to become a fan of Paul McCartney and I was anticipating the release of this. And this was a huge album for me in the summer of 1989, uh, which was a, a big year in my life. And looking back on it now, 30 odd years later, I can see it a bit more objectively. I can see that it's not a great album towards the end, for example, in my opinion. I think it starts off great. I think My Brave Face is one of the great 1980s Paul McCartney singles. Maybe overlooked a little bit, I think. I quite enjoy Rough Ride. I know a lot of people think that's a bit of inconsequential fluff, but I, to me it's quite enjoyable. You've got the first of his uh, collaborations with Elvis Costello here on You Want Her Too, which is, a, which is an interesting song. Never been one of my favourites, to be honest, but uh, it's it was good to see them collaborating and Paul collaborating with somebody who could tell it to him straight. It then goes on a run that I think is superb on this album and there are not many Paul McCartney albums for me that have a run as good as Distractions, We Got Married, Put It There, Figure of Eight, this one. That is seriously good. But then the album, to me, falls off an absolute cliff from that point. I really do not like Don't Be Careless Love and I never have done. I think the opening sort of gospel style is just too high uh, and it kind of gets lost in a, in a higher register than it needs to be. Not an enjoyable song for me, neither is Motor of Love. Uh, I, I talked in a previous episode about Gratitude from Memory Almost Full being sort of one of my uh, most, most disliked Paul McCartney songs. You can put Motor of Love in there with that as well as Don't Be Careless Love. I couldn't always see that back then, but now this seems more clear to me that I really don't like the end of this album. I prefer this album when it has Uwe La Sole at the end as it does on the CD version. I always kind of miss it on vinyl when it's not there. That to me is the proper ending for this album. But Flowers in the Dirt, I am always going to get enjoyment from the nostalgia factor as much as anything, and that does help bump it up the rankings. At this point, I am putting this in fourth place behind Chaos and Creation in the Backyard and just above Memory Almost Full. We then go back, it kind of has two release dates. Uh, does this based on when it was released in Russia and when it was released in the rest of the world? But originally, this album came before Flowers in the Dirt, so that's where I'm, I'm going next. Paul's first album of rock and roll covers and I've often wondered whether did Paul need to do this or feel that he needed to do this because he'd had such a critical panning over the previous few years. Did he need to sort of uh, take comfort in something that was familiar to him and something that he could just enjoy rather than uh, be worrying about the sort of uh, the, the critical reception it was going to get? I wonder, I could be wrong with that, I don't know. Uh, I prefer Run Devil Run to this album. I think the production is a little bit a little bit weak for me and a little bit uh, sort of lacking in the, the kind of oomph and meat that I think Run Devil Run has as an album. Unfortunately the vinyl doesn't have my favourite song from this album which is on the CD version and that's Summertime. Uh, I loved that version of that but unfortunately not on the vinyl. This is an enjoyable album though um, but for me, it's not going to be as enjoyable as nearly all of his other albums. I do enjoy That's All Right, Mama on here. That is probably probably my favourite. And ain't that a shame. It was great to see him doing that kind of thing again, sort of bigging it up with the, the sort of fast domino style of singing that he did. 
But at the moment, this is going down into 14th and currently final position because although I do enjoy it, and if I put this on now, I would enjoy it, I just enjoy the other albums that bit more. So 14th place at the moment. We then go back to press to play. Well, what do we say about this album? I know some people really, really dislike this album. Some people absolutely adore this album. It is a real... It's one that's really splitting opinion and has done for decades now. I appreciate the fact that Paul was trying to be creative on this album. It doesn't always work, but more often than not for me, I enjoy what he's trying to do on here. Uh, the similarities for me and, uh, to me with uh, Chaos and Creation in the Backyard here, because on that album, he was when he was working with Nigel, Nigel Godrich and there was those fallouts there and Nigel was trying to push him and it didn't always go too well. Similar thing here with Hugh Padgham. Paul had brought Hugh Padgham on board because he was kind of the big hit producer of the time of, of 80s hits. He'd been doing work with The Police and Phil Collins and, and having a lot of success. And Paul brought him in to, to hopefully try and um, sort of feed off a bit of that vibe. But there were certainly clashes there in terms of... Uh, in terms of uh, personality and, and what they were trying to achieve from the sessions. Stranglehold is, uh, I think, a really nice opening to the album. Uh, there's a really good, uh, there's a really interesting line near the beginning of that where he says um, uh, about, can you slip me the answer? And we know that that's what, uh, that's what John Lennon said to the Maharishi uh, when they went up in a helicopter. We see clippings of it in, in anthology. And uh, Paul says there that John had asked the Maharishi to slip him the answer, the answer to life. And it's great to see that line referenced in Stranglehold. Uh, talk More Talk is absolutely crazy. Uh, I've still never wrapped my head around it, but I think it's a thoroughly enjoyable song. Uh, partly because I'm sat there open mouth thinking, who on earth thought this was a good idea? But I find it really enjoyable. Footprints to me is like a lost Christmas song. It just needs a few sleigh bells and a couple of mentions of Santa and you've got a really nice Christmas song there. So is that kind of a missed opportunity? It could have been some sort of a, a Christmas song in the vein of maybe Kate Bush's December Will Be Magic Again. It could have had that kind of a vibe to it if it had just been made a little bit more Christmassy. Uh, press is very much maligned as a... A lead-off single here and probably not his finest moment as a lead-off single and angry well Paul's trying to get angry I'm not sure how angry he actually is on the song but interesting nonetheless I think the cover is it's a beautiful photograph of Paul and Linda but it just doesn't seem to match the album that's within and I, I'm not sure whether that photograph served the album well beautiful as it is Maybe a different photograph might have matched the album a bit better. But I have always liked uh, in the middle here how they've done, the kind of done drawings of the soundscape of like where everything is in the orchestra. Really well put together thing and it showed that in the mid 80s, even if it wasn't always working, that Paul was still trying to be really creative. So I enjoy this album very much. And at the moment, at this point, it is going in seventh place in my ranking. So it is just below McCartney 3, which again, another another creative album, uh, but just off above Off The Ground. And I think I put it above Off The Ground because of the it's a much more creative album than that. So going back from Press To Play, we then go back to Give My Regards To Broad Street. Ooh. Well, what a project this was. The film, I mean, I haven't seen the film now for about 20 years and I'm not in a massive rush to see it again, but if we got an archive collection edition of this, that would be great and I would love to see a, a, a remastered version of the film in that and let, let's try and appreciate it again all these years later. The album itself is the very definition of a mixed bag. Uh, it's... Some of the songs are obviously remakes of old Beatles songs, wing songs. Some of them f you feel, um, just you just think, why? It's, it's very unusual that you've got remakes of, for example, uh, Ballroom Dancing and Wanderlust, as, as nice as they are. And of course it's from the film, so I understand why, but you know, these were only on an album. These were only new songs a couple of years earlier and already he's remaking them. So it, it's, 
it sort of feels strange from that. No More Lonely Nights, of course, uh, is it's probably Paul's last big smash hit single. Uh, because from that point onwards, he, he tended to, he, he wasn't really sort of getting top threes, top fives, or even top ten singles so much after that. I really like the medley that's on here of uh, Yesterday, Here, There and Everywhere and Wanderlust. I think that is, those three fit together really nice. It's done very well and uh, probably just about the highlight of the album for me. The other two new songs, of course, you've got Not Such a Bad Boy and No Values. You know, decent Paul McCartney sort of poppy rockers. Um, and nothing amazing. They would have just been sort of regular album tracks on anything else. They wouldn't have stood out on any album. But they're pleasant enough. Uh, I quite like Eleanor's Dream that follows on from the cover of Eleanor Rigby and, and sort of take, shows us where that song could have gone. Uh, had in 1966 they've been they've been considering these things as sort of eight minute pieces that might be the direction it had headed off in but I quite enjoy Eleanor's Dream Long and Winding Road is a fairly pointless saxophone remake um, which I've never been too fussed about and the cover of the, the remake of Silly Love Songs is just not a patch on the original so this is a real mixed bag and I don't play the whole the whole album too often, to be honest. Um, but I enjoy it when I do for the highlights of it. And because of the highlights, I'm putting it in 12th place below new, uh, but actually still above Driving Rain. Uh, I, I think I would probably come off the back of this enjoying it more. Although I don't necessarily like some of the remakes, the quality of the songs lifts it up. We're then going back to Pipes of Peace. I've had a really weird history with this album. I really, really did not like this album uh, for probably a good 15 years. I first got to know this album in the early 1990s when the Paul McCartney Collection CDs came out in 93. And for about 15 years, I really wasn't keen on this album at all. Uh, but I've started to enjoy it a lot more in recent years. You cannot argue well, some of you probably will, with uh, an album that opens up with two songs of the quality of Pipes of Peace and Say Say Say. Uh, now, Pipes of Peace was the first Paul McCartney song that I knew, and I absolutely adored it. So again, it's another really, really important song for me in my history of uh, loving the Beatles and Paul McCartney because it was the, it was the introduction to me to Paul McCartney as a solo artist. Say Say Say, to get... To have collaborations with Michael Jackson at this point when Thriller has just come out and he is the absolute hottest thing on the planet and you've got what was, uh, it was a number one smash in America I believe but didn't make it to number one in the UK uh, partly because of, of bad timing, the video wasn't ready and by the time the video was ready uh, the, the song had slipped down the charts because they hadn't been showing it on Top of the Pops because there was no video. And Top of the Pops didn't show songs that were slipping in the charts. So it kind of got off to a really weird start and, and maybe didn't fulfil its potential in the UK charts as a, as a result. The, the songs that are on here are all kind of really likeable songs and enjoyable. They're just maybe a little bit lightweight. So... They're good songs, The Other Me, Keep Undercover. So Bad is a, is a beautiful song. I'll, I'll give that... I'm not putting that in the lightweight category. I think that's got a bit more to it. Uh, the Man, again, the, the other uh, collaboration with Michael Jackson. Very interesting. It's, it's probably a song that's easy to knock, and I imagine a, a few people watching will probably hate that song. I don't mind it. I don't love it, but it's okay. And again, it's kind of inoffensive mild lightweight pop again i think average person hey 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 tug of peace through our love is, is his attempt at the big ballad at the end so i do enjoy it and it could have been a lot higher in my rankings had there been a bit more sort of uh, heft to it but i am putting that in 10th place at the moment below electric arguments uh, but just above run devil run um, i wouldn't have had it this high in the past but it is certainly growing on me We've then got Tug of War, 1982. This is the first album that Paul made following the death of John Lennon. And I've often wondered, you know, this is, Paul is now at this point, he is the only remaining member of Lennon and McCartney. 
Whether that affected the quality of the songs he was able to put together to this, I don't know. But this is a great album. This is one that, uh, it was a bit of a slow burner for me. It sort of kind of took a few years for me to realise how good this album was. Uh, but the Tug of War is a, is a stunning opening song. It really is. And it shows Paul is, you know, up there near the peak of him as a songwriter. Um, absolutely gorgeous song. Take It Away is a great pop song. Uh, Somebody Who Cares, it's okay. It's got some nice, uh, it's got some nice sort of flamenco guitar in it that I like, and it's a decent song. What's That You Doing with Stevie Wonder? Now this, that to me, that's a song that could have been a lot better. I think it goes on too long, and, and it ought to be really funky and really great. I think maybe if it was a couple of minutes shorter, I would probably like that song a lot more. Here today, what can you say about here today? It's just Paul's song for John, absolutely gorgeous. And you, you, you get the impression that Paul really means it. He's not doing it just because um, somebody expects that he ought to. He's doing it because he wants to say these things. And it's as beautiful today as it was 40 years ago. I really enjoy ballroom dancing. Uh, I think that's a good fun pop song. The Pound Is Sinking is an absolute highlight of this album for me. I think it's uh, it's like it's an it's it's up there with Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey. It's kind of that ten years on. It's another song where he's he's mixing a few different styles together. He's having fun with it at the same time, and for me, it's almost up there with Uncle Albert in terms of quality. I think that is a great song, uh, and the, there's the point where he where his his vocal suddenly sort of soars in and the song gets serious after he's been doing his little jokey part about the various different currencies and the song just kicks in and you think, oh yes, he is the man, he is giving this song everything. Really, really enjoy it. Get it, um, it's it's there, it's on the album, It's it doesn't do a lot for me, um, it's just kind of there and inoffensive really. And then you've got Dress Me Up As A Robber, which is nice. I like the bass line on Dress Me Up As A Robber. It's very, very similar to Morse Moose and The Grey Goose from London Town, which is a song that I really love. So I think it's quite a funky little, um, sort of, in, instrumentally, I think it's a really funky song, It's Dress Me Up As A Robber. So I do quite enjoy that. Ebony and Ivory at the end, I think is a song that has had far too much hate sent its way. It's a good pop song. It's a good, well-made, written song. Between two legends uh, of the music business, all right, it's a bit schmaltzy and the, the subject matter is um, it, it's sort of pushed in your face a bit. But ultimately, I think it's a good song. I enjoy, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to go on record and say I enjoy Ebony and Ivory. So there. Uh, but I understand that many of you absolutely hate it. Uh, where am I going to put this? Well, how high up is it going to go? Is it going to go right to the top? Not quite. It's going to go at number two for me at the moment, just behind Flaming Pie. So in terms of everything that Paul has released from Tug of War onwards, there is only Flaming Pie that I would rate higher than this. That is a great album. That's all the albums that I'm going to do in this episode three. Uh, I will be back very soon with the next episode where we'll go from McCartney 2 and work our way backwards even further, continuing with this ranking. Let me know in the comments how you would have ranked these or whether you're absolutely disgusted with where I've put some of these albums. And thank you very much for watching. I'll see you again very soon. Goodbye.